Well, hey there, everybody. Matt Heller here, founder of Performance Optimist Consulting and the author of The Myth of Employee Burnout, here with another episode of Three Questions. This is where I get to prepare three questions for a guest, they get to prepare three questions for me, and then we just see where the conversation goes. We don't know what those questions are uh, starting off, so all of our answers are unrehearsed and unplanned. Very excited to have John Anderson as my guest today. John is the excuse me, Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of Administration for the Michigan Science Center. John and I go way back. We served on the Human Resources Committee for IAPA uh, a number of years together, and also I remember a couple of IAPA um, expos, John, where you and I trolled the aisles looking for the best tram or carousel, and I think we always ended up at the Dippin' Dots cart. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, John, welcome, and uh, just give us a, a kind of a quick glimpse into who you are and what you do before we get started. Well, thanks for having me, Matt. I'm glad to be talking to you. Um, so I have uh, joined the Michigan Science Center about six months ago after a 20-year uh, stint with the Detroit Zoo, where I was most recently the director of operations. And um, I am so thrilled to be part of um, an incredible organization that's right here in the heart of downtown Detroit. Just an amazing place to be in 2015. Um, I've got a variety of um, experience in my background, uh, everything from animal care to uh, 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 visitor services and uh, information technology, <laughs> though you wouldn't know it by <laughs> how long it took me to connect with you today. And um, uh, yeah, and so um, here at the, at the Science Center, um, among other things, um, I work with the visitor services team and the... Uh, um, uh, uh, the financial and HR uh, functions of the organization, um, and um, it's been a real change, Matt, as you know. So Yeah, awesome. Well, are you ready to get to your first question? Uh, I am. Okay. It kind of taps into what we were just talking about before we actually went live officially, um, and that is, what was your boldest career move in your career? Well, um, so uh, after working at the same organization for 22 years, um, I, my secret plan uh, was that I was going to um, grow old and die with the same organization. Um, I had an opportunity, and um, I I moved. Um, and I, I I mean I don't know if that was how bold it was a move for for everyone else, but it certainly felt bold on my part. Um, I was uh, I was very good at working uh, with the team that I had at the at the organization that I was with, um, but I was not um, very practiced at um, working with a new team in a new place, uh, and it was pretty scary. Um, turns out to have been a great move uh, that I am thrilled about, uh, um, but uh, that um, I mean some people are. Right? Some people go bungee jumping, and some people <laughs> go rock climbing, and some people go parachuting. Um, and some of us tend to be more conservative and would like to uh, make our long-term investments in um, very solid, low-yield, low-risk uh, uh, vehicles. And um, so f for me, that was, uh, uh, that was a big deal. Okay. Awesome. Cool. And so speaking of... Um, so speaking of change, yeah, uh, you've made a change in your life recently. Um, after a l long and hallowed career, um, you decided to s step out uh, on your own and even re relocate. What's that like? Well, there are kind of two things that are very related. Um, stepping out on my own was... I guess would say, would 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 kind of categorize that as bold, but I you know it was something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and um, you know being involved with IAPA, I I had the opportunity to work with so many different people around the industry, and and so it it in some ways it very very much seemed like a very natural extension of what I was doing, but I'll I'll admit I mean it was scary you know saying no longer that I had a steady paycheck or that somebody else was covering my benefits and you know those kind of things so it was scary but I also think it was the right time and I I felt good about it when I when I did it certainly and um, and then 
kind of the second part of your question, I did just recently move from Florida to North Carolina, and the the reason that I could do that is because now that I work for myself, I can work anywhere as long as I have an internet connection and um, some technical prowess and um, and access to an airport. Really, I can I can go wherever I need to go. So um, it was just it, that was really more of a, a question of what kind of what kind of life and surroundings that my wife and I wanted to have. And um, you know, Orlando was great for a lot of things, but. You know, we're both from northern places. She's from Michigan, and you know, I'm originally from Ohio, and I've lived in New Hampshire and Minnesota, and we didn't want to quite go back that far and you know deal with snow and that much cold. Um, so we kind of picked a, a spot kind of halfway in the middle and landed here in North Carolina, and you know, just love it here. We're we're in the mountains of Western North Carolina, so we're we're really loving it. So it's it's been a great adventure so far. That's great. I uh, uh, I mean I've. The idea of moving house uh, again, uh, Matt, is not exactly terrifying to me, but um, there are many things that I would rather do than pick up my entire life and put it in a box and then put it in a truck. And I, uh, I, I commend you for your um, <laughs> choice. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, it was you know like anytime you move that much stuff, it's not it's not an easy process. But you know, I had lived in in apartments up until I met my wife, and she had a house, so you know. We, I moved in there after we got married, and um, so this is, you know, it was it was my first time moving that big of a entity, you know, moving the whole house and things. So um, I, I don't want to do it again anytime soon. So we're we're gonna stick, we're gonna make it work no matter what while we're here. So I uh, uh, I've decided a couple things in my life, Matt. I'm perfectly capable of changing the oil in my car, um, but I will let other people do that from from now until the day I die, and um, the next time I move, I'm going to sit on the couch while uh, someone else puts everything in a box and carries it out to the truck. Yeah. And again, while I lift a couch um, or try and take the door off a refrigerator, uh, <laughs> I think it's it's that time. Uh, right, right. And you know, you get to a point in your life where you know certain things, like you said, are more important. So you know, probably saving your back is more important than you know <laughs> saying to yourself, "Yes, I lifted a couch." Yeah. So, awesome, awesome. All right, so um, kind of getting back to uh, business a little bit, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges facing young leaders uh, today, whether it's at a museum or an attraction or a science center, or wherever it happens to be? So that's an interesting question. Um, one of the things that's really, uh, one of the things that has um, been a, a, a real sort of exploration for me at, um, at the Michigan Science Center is that in many ways this organization is a startup. The company itself has only been around for about three years um, and the staff is on average um, fairly young um, uh, and folks who um, uh, a lot of the staff, um, uh, a lot of the staff even in supervisory and management roles is um, in their kind of first opportunity out of college. Um, and uh, uh, and the other thing I guess I, I should mention is that um, the museum is located in the cultural cultural center uh, that's um, sort of wrapped right in with um, local state university Wayne State University. Um, so the environment is um, you know it has it has aspects of uh, being a college town um, and that sort of um, uh, uh, vibrant. Um, youthful, um, perhaps boisterous, uh, right, circumstance. Um, anyway, uh, your question is, is interesting um, because my, um, my view of the world, uh, just by the, the time I spent with the same organization, right, uh, my view of the world is very much sort of through the lens of one company, one group of people, one sort of executive leadership style, um, and uh, the people that I work with now um, are folks who are leaders or up-and-coming leaders who are, who are um, I mean, if if not if not sort of millennials themselves, dar darn close to it. Um, and I don't know that I'm even in a position to sort of render an opinion on like 
what the challenge or opportunity is, um, but it's a different uh, it's a different outlook on um, sort of the individual role and the organizational role. Like right, what the um, what the role of the organization, in this case a nonprofit museum, um, sort of should be to uh, to the employees, to the volunteers, and to the community. Um, and I think that's a, um, I think having to sort of shape your leadership style around those different constituencies is, um, it's interesting for, for me to look at because I don't feel like uh, as I was developing, um, I felt uh, I felt the pull of all those different constituencies in the same way. I'm probably not making uh, a ton of sense at this point here, Matt. Um, but what I mean to say is that um, there's very much a sense, at least here, um, that maybe um, maybe it's other places, um, that that um, the responsibility of being a leader is to um, is is to the rest of, of your colleagues, um, but much more broadly um, to um, to cascade that that leadership throughout um, your your out of work peer group and the community as a whole. Um, and so that's um, that's an interesting way to sort of look at what the role of the entire organization, how the mission of the organization wraps into um, sort of the daily programmatic activities that you do. Um, and right, there are consequences to choices we make. We can have a program um, at a certain day or a certain time that um, appeals to, to, to people in, in different ways. Um, and I feel very much like there's so much input that um, that the that the the that the leaders here are working with. There's so many um, groups that they're trying to not not just satisfy, but sort of to under to genuinely understand, right? To embrace and, and understand um, that it uh, um, it seems like it it can be a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I'm having a conversation. Maybe I'm having a conversation here about sort of um, the the millennials in general. Um, but I think uh, I mean I, I work with a lot of people who are who are much much younger than I am, who are very capable leaders, but who have um, who have a perspective that is substantially different f from mine and 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 the cohort of leaders that I grew up with mm -hmm. um, and I think um, I think that makes the I think that makes the interface between um, sort of younger leaders and older leaders um, potentially problematic um, but in a really interesting interesting way that um, that requires us to be sort of very introspective about why we're doing what we do well I think you hit on something really interesting there that I think there is a larger desire to really be connected to the why of what an organization does more so now than maybe ever it has been before. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of things that you said there about community and sort of taking the larger, larger view of the scope of leadership, I think is, is probably where, again, you know, you, you bring that back down and that's where a lot of that input comes from and it becomes a little overwhelming. So I, I do think if you could distill all that down, that's one of the big challenges is that, you know, you've got all this input, you've got all these things coming at you and how do you, and more information than ever, how do you now make a decision knowing that you still have to make the right decision, um, you still have to pull the trigger on something, um, but back when you and I were growing up as leaders, there was a lot less information out there, there's a lot less input, a lot less things for us to go on. Um, and who's to say what's better or worse? Maybe we went more on our gut, and now they're going more on, you know, the the data and what they've what they've gathered through, you know, through other channels. Um, and maybe they're making better decisions, more informed decisions. Um, 
But I, I also think, you know, you bring up something interesting, how this could be, you know, difficult between different generations of leaders, because we definitely see that if people aren't open minded enough to say, hey, this is just a different way to look at it, not a bad way. You know, that can be a that can be something that gets in the way of, of the relationship. And you know, there's an interesting manifestation of that, that um, that I, I've um, well, that I've noticed and, and at times struggled with, which is that um, it seems like because there's so much information coming, streaming at you in real time, or streaming at, at, at everyone in real time, mm -hmm. the, the sort of perception of risk or the criticality of a decision um, is, um, is, is elevated, right? There's this, um, there's this almost palpable sense of we need to make a decision right now because we have the information right now, and the consequence of a bad decision is potentially um, very significant because the impact is going to be felt right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, um, one of the uh, one of the ideas um, that we've worked on together since I've been here is this notion of um, taking thoughtful action. Um, this kind of Two legs to, to that stool. Um, um, we've agreed with each other to, uh, to 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 be relentlessly optimistic and to take thoughtful action, and um, that's both being thoughtful and taking action. Uh, because of what you said, is that the 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 um, the fear of making a wrong decision leads to right no decision at all at times. Okay. Um, and then this sort of paralysis of analysis that cascades, uh, you know, cascades throughout everything that that goes on. Um, and whether it's good or bad, I, I feel fortunate that I can sort of um, step back a little bit and not be. <laughs> Maybe it's because I don't, I don't have a Twitter to check all the time, but, uh, right? And not feel like um, the sky is falling if if uh, if we don't post the right response instantly, uh, but I think that must be very um, I mean, that must be very overwhelming. I, I certainly mm -hmm. um, when I get emails at three in the morning from someone who's who's um, who's concerned about um, how we're going to re respond to TripAdvisor or um, you know want to change the the wording on uh, whatever some document. Um, the sense that if we don't do it right now, there's going to be a disaster is sort of, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's both inspiring and unfortunate, right? Mm -hmm. Glad that we're paying attention to these details and being responsive to our, uh, the needs of our constituents, our guests, um, but also, um, you know, to be an effective human being, you have to have time for both your work self and your not work self. Mm -hmm. and it seems like there is a there is there is no non work self uh, for a lot of people for younger leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that has a double edged sword too because they're so connected to the work that you know in a lot of cases you're you're like well you know how. The, the, the loyalty that somebody has when they're that connected, you know, you, you would love that kind of off the charts loyalty, but at the same time, now you're getting emails, like you said, at three o'clock in the morning because they're not turning it off. Um, and, you know, there, there is a balance there. And, you know, a lot of people have written how the work-life balance has changed and, you know, what that really looks like. And, you know, do I, do I compartmentalize and work from eight to five? And then, you know, I'm at home from five to midnight, you know, with, with my family and, you know, is that, work-life balance or being able to answer that email at 3.15 in the morning and then take it off your off your mind and off your plate, is that the new work-life balance? Being able to, and we're so connected with all of our devices that, you know, it's 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 hard not to get overwhelmed. But you said something, you know, about you, you don't have Twitter, and I, I think it'd be interesting to see you on Twitter, by the way. Oh. Um, but, but what I learned long ago is that, you know, trying to use Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, you know, to to help connect with people, and that's really all they are. They're just different ways to connect with people. Um, but what I realized long ago was that, you know, if it's not right for you, don't do it. I mean, don't try to do it just because you want to. And and the other thing is that, you know, if if it's something where you feel like you're struggling to do it, then it probably isn't what you should be doing. You know what I mean? So, um, 
if you're if you're struggling to keep up and you're trying to trying to keep up with every single thing that's out there, there's just no way you can do it. There's you, you can't. And so just kind of letting that go and being thoughtfully optimistic about the things that you can um, affect, I think that's that kind of brings that that piece of it kind of full circle a little bit. That's yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Cool. So, so, so now I'm supposed to ask you a question, right? Please. Um, well, so this is a work-related question, but uh, it's going to sound like it's not a work-related. Um, All right. I, um, that outside of the um, incredible professional work that you do, um, you're uh, you're also a, an artist, a musician, and um, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious what. Um, I'm curious how the how the the, the role. What you think the role of the sort of the non, um, the non-professional? Um, I don't want to say that you may well be a professional musician, Matt. And I, I certainly, if I haven't had the opportunity <laughs> to buy tickets, I'll, I'll buy tickets. Thank you. But, um, like I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about that. Um, let me back up. Okay. <laughs> One of the things um, that inspired me to to make a change in my career is that I work for very dynamic. Um, CEO now, who is um, both a bio uh, biomedical engineer, um, the president of a science center, and also an artist of the spoken word, a poet. Um, and I'm um, so struck by the right brain, left brain um, kind of um, uh, I'm so struck by the number of people I know who I consider to be um, role models and excellent leaders who are um, both, uh, you know, rigorous professionals, but have a, um, a very um, artistic or creative um, portion to their lives. And um, you're one of those people. Oh, well, thank you. And I'm just, I'm curious to, you know, what that means to you. And some people just have hobbies and some people have um, you know, a calling outside of their career. Yeah. Well, it's first of all, thank you for the compliment. I truly appreciate it. Honored that you think that. Um, and it's funny because on, on one of these other episodes, I was asked if I wasn't in my current profession, what I would be doing. And my immediate answer was I'd be trying to, you know, further my career as a drummer, um, trying to, trying to be on the big stage someplace. Um, but I, I think there's a there's a big connection. First of all, I, I guess on a couple of levels. First of all, I think there's a big connection between being, you know, have, having a, a good presence in what you do professionally, and then having these other outside interests, whatever they are. You know, whether it's woodworking, or if it's if it's music, or if it's art, or if it's you know any sort of creative working on a car, whatever it is. Anything that gets your mind working in different ways, I think, helps you be creative in what you do for a profession. So I think, and, and again, doesn't matter what what that is, but I think there's a there's a balance there of of understanding that those two those things are related. For me specifically, um, I look at when I'm when I'm in front of people, you know, as an audience, I really look at that as a performance, and I think every time I get on stage behind the drums, that's a performance. And so I kind of approach them in the same way. So I know a lot of people when they when they're, you know, trainers, they they approach it more as a teacher trainer kind of thing. And I'm more of a more on the performance actor comedian side. Not that I'm a good actor or comedian, but that's sort of the the lens, as you said earlier, that's the lens that I look at it through. So I'm trying to engage the audience in different ways. I'm trying to, you know, to read the audience. So if, if things are getting a little, you know, the energy is getting low, I try to do something to pick it up. And, you know, so I'm trying to, I, and I, I kind of got that training, if you will, from being a musician and being on stage. And so now I, I bring that into to my work. So I think your question, I guess, in my mind is, is, like I said, twofold in that, you know, I think both influence each other, you know, an outside interest, whether creative or, or just a, another hobby, I think that influences. And then I think for me specifically, I've been able to kind of tie those two together. And while I don't get to play drums as much as I would like, um, I definitely use that 
that kind of creative side when I'm when I'm doing what I do professionally. Does that answer the question? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, and I mean, I think it makes I think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, and um, I mean, certainly when when you think about it, you can see that. I mean, those connections make a lot of sense when you explain them uh, in the way that they're related. Yeah, it is. I mean, what we do in many ways in our industry uh, uh, is right is perform. And we even we even talk about our businesses as though they're performances. Yeah. Um, in front of house and, and backstage and with our cast members, um, and uh, I think it's just. Uh, um, I feel like it's a topic that I haven't heard a lot about, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if uh, I don't know if there's um, you know I don't know if that's part of a work-life balance conversation or if it's part of a kind of bigger conversation about being a whole person to be the most effective leader you can be. Oh sure. Well, I think the the people that I know that I that I see as the most well-rounded are the people that have pretty deep um, interests in a lot of areas, and you wonder where they have that kind of time, you know, in the day to get that involved in that many different things. Um, but I find that those are the people that are. Well, it's not as surprising to me anymore to learn that they're that well-rounded. But you know, when I first started, you know, studying leaders and and you know, really talking to a lot of the leaders that I, that I respect, that I thought that they were just about leadership and business, and that was it. But you know, to come to find out that they have so many of these other really deep interests, that it takes time to cultivate those things. You know, if somebody is a a wonderful business leader, but they're also a concert violinist, oh my gosh! I mean, it takes. <laughs> years. I failed violin class in college. I know it takes a lot of time to become that good at, at anything. Um, so, you know, to, to know that they've put that kind of dedication into, you know, an art or, you know, some hobby, I think it's really inspiring. But I think it also goes to that person's personality. So if they are, you know, kind of full in on everything they do, they're probably going to be a very involved and very good leader, but they're also going to be good at all those other things that they do. And, um, you know, they just they just find extra time in the day to do all that stuff. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. So are you ready for your last question? I am. All right. So this one, it may harken back to your previous, previous job. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it's one of those deserted island questions. But it's maybe a little different. I've, I haven't heard it asked this way before. But if you were on a deserted island, and for the rest of your life, you could only smell one smell, one aroma for the rest of your life, what would it be? Wow. Um, uh, OK. Um, I think um, it's, I think um, it, the, the smell of, of autumn leaves is going to be my reference. Okay. Good, good. Uh, funnel, funnel cakes was right up there. <laughs> funnel cakes was right up there. Yeah. Cinnamon buns. That's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for me, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, autumn leaves. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe it's just because it's, it's autumn here uh, up in the right. north states. And, uh, um. You know there are um, they they say that that scents um, are powerful uh, memory triggers and for me um, uh, autumn is uh, you know is a time that um, that that um, oh it you know it harkens the the beginning of the the holiday season and um, all the things that you do with your your family and friends and um, and all of the stuff that that. We do in our businesses to um, make this the season special. Um, I autumn is a, is my favorite time of year for okay. sure. Um, I, I Matt, you have you've thrown me for a loop with this question. I'm doing <laughs> it for oh, wow. Well, and so if you if you do decide to ch change your answer, or if something else comes up, then you know please you know email me or let me know. But um, um, I think autumn leaves is a good 
especially given what you just said about you know autumn being your favorite time of year. I think it's a great a great representation of that. There's there's something about um, there's something about autumn and and holidays and um, in, and family that all that speaks to um, gathering together and ritual um, that um, I think in general um, people find comforting mm -hmm. and I, I love the fact that the things that we do at our museums, zoos, family entertainment centers, amusement parks, the hotels, resorts um, are about uh, are about the gathering together and the ritual and the um, you know and the sort of the celebration of um, great experiences with people you care about. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. All right. You have All one right. more. You ready for your last question? I'm ready. Bring it. Excellent. So uh, you do. Um, a lot of work with a lot of different organizations, and um, and you've um, in your in your book the the myth of employee burnout. Um, you uh, well, what I t t t take away um, from that book is um, is the need for um, for leaders to be um, analytical and self. Um, Self-evaluative about um, about how they uh, how they create an environment um, that doesn't that doesn't doesn't lead to this sort of mythical burnout, degradation, uh, disinterest. And I'm just wondering if, as you've worked on your various projects and with your various clients, if there's a um, if there's a common like if you had to distill down everything you do into one drop of really good advice for leaders, what would it be? Wow, um, I think what comes to mind, and I I think it comes from. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna screw this up, but anyway, um, it's know thyself. Know thyself. Um, and there's another part to that that I can't remember, but um, you, you have to know who you are as a leader. And I think that comes from, like you said, really analyzing what you do and what kind of impact you make on a, on a, on a, um, um, on an organization, on a team, on an individual. Um, and a lot of people don't necessarily understand what that impact is. They don't, understand that when they say something in a certain way to someone that that three different people can take that in three different ways and so I think it's it's understanding who they are where they want to be going what they want to be doing and how they're how they impact other people um, you know you mentioned at the beginning of this how you change jobs from someplace you were for 22 years and moved into something new and it's been a great opportunity so far and I think part of knowing yourself is knowing when it's time to make those changes and when it's time to say, you know what, I've, I've learned what I can learn here and, you know, maybe I, you know, I'm good at it, but, you know, maybe there's another challenge out there for me and knowing when to take that step um, and sometimes taking steps that are a little scary for you, but that's also where you grow. So um, I think it's really knowing, knowing kind of who you are um, and that can be a lifelong journey for people. So that's not, it's, that may be one quick little piece of advice, but it's, it's not something that happens overnight that people, people don't, um, don't necessarily know what that is or what that looks like. So what, what, what's the joke? It's uh, I wouldn't, I would never join a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> right. Like, right. Knowing yourself, that's a, I mean, that, that could be a pretty, that's a, that could be a pretty bold move, uh, right? If, I mean, you, that, that means knowing good stuff and bad stuff and stuff you're proud of and stuff you're not proud of. Well, I think along with that, it's, it's admitting what that bad stuff is and admitting that you, that you can improve it and you can work on it and you're open to it. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, and myself included, when you, when you do something that you don't, you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily proud of, 
Um, but you also don't want to admit it because that means then you have to change. And a lot of people don't like to change and they think they're, they're just fine the way they are. And, um, you know, it's, it's not until you realize that you have the choice to change and yes, there may be consequences, but there could also be these positive outputs um, to change that can, that can really, you know, take you to the next level. So I think that's a, that's a big part of it for sure. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. So uh, John, I want to thank you so much for, for being part of three questions. Um, I know it was a little tough getting the technology to work, but I'm, I'm glad we stuck with it and really enjoyed our conversation. Um, if anybody out there uh, listening wants to be a part of three questions or you know of somebody that wants that you would like to see on the, on the program, please feel free to email me at matt at performanceoptimist.com. So thanks very much, John, and everybody who's been watching, and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.